Hi, I'm Warren Marcus, the producer of the Great North American Revival Series. I pray that by now you have watched the DVDs of these three awesome revivals, the Toronto Blessing, the Brownsville Revival, and the Smithton Outpouring. If I were you, I'd watch them over and over again. Show them to others. The more time you spend immersed in these great revivals, the greater the anointing will be that God will pour out on you. As you and others, you disciple, learn to tarry or soak in the presence of God every day, you will experience salvation, deliverance, healing, miracles. The supernatural of God will become a normal occurrence. The DVD you are now watching is the capstone of the series. I am going to share with you how revival has forever transformed my life. You will learn the secrets imparted to me by spending over eight years immersed in these revivals while filming them. I am going to walk you through the process of receiving God's revival fire, and I'm going to teach you how to walk in revival every day. As I walk through this process with you and guide you through each step, I have included prayers of impartation that will help you to begin to experience God's revival fire. Once you begin to get a taste of revival, you will never be the same again. But in order for you to stay in revival every day and keep the power of God flowing upon you from heaven, I have enclosed a special daily prayer of cleansing and consecration. This is the prayer that I use and go before God with every morning. It will help assure you that you remain a pure, clean, and holy dwelling place, a holy temple for the Holy Spirit to powerfully fill you every day. I am amazed how God uses me to be a channel of his blessings to others as I start my day with these prayers. And I know that as you use these prayers, that it will help you be that channel of blessing for the people in your life. Now get ready for how to walk in revival every day. Well, my name is Warren Marcus, and I'm the producer of the great North American Revival Series, where I documented three great revivals, Toronto, the Toronto Blessing as it's known, the Smithton Outpouring, and the Brownsville Revival. And how I got involved in shooting these documentaries was I was minding my own business. I was the executive producer of Dr. Jerry Falwell's Old Time Gospel Hour. <laughs> and Sid Roth called me up, who was a longtime friend, another Jewish believer in Messiah, and said, we're going to Toronto, and we're going to start a show, and I need you to help me, called It Supernatural. And so he took me to Toronto, and we wound up shooting these shows. And he said, oh, by the way, we're going to go to this church while we're there called the Toronto Blessing. And did you ever hear of that? I said, is that that place where they bark like dogs? And he said, Warren, come on, you've been hanging around in Baptistville too long. <laughs> but anyway, I love my Baptist friends. I do. And there were a lot of Baptists in Toronto, believe it or not. They came out of just coming there and getting touched and blasted. Anyway, so it's that man's fault, Sid Roth. If you want to blame anything, blame him. But what we're going to share today is we're going to show you some of, the, some of the clips from these great revivals, but there's a meaning behind this. There's a reason why I'm sharing this, because I believe God could impart through this revival. I believe people will be watching this, and some are right now, 
in their homes watching this series, and they're watching a specific DVD, this mentoring DVD, and God's going to start pouring out his spirit, and revival is going to start breaking out in homes, in people's living rooms, in people's churches as they show this. And over, what happened was, when these revivals happened, it was amazing. Toronto, over four and a half million people came from all over the world to Toronto to come and experience God's presence in that revival. Another four million people came to the Brownsville revival in Pensacola, Florida, and it was hard to get there. And then this little town of 532 people in Missouri, Smithton, over 300,000 people came there, and it was hard to get to. You flew into the Kansas City airport, two-hour drive through rural type things, and I'm gonna show you something that what that church, just think of these people invading that little town of 532 people, didn't even have a gas station, you know? It was crazy, but God, people were so hungry. Here's what I wanna share with you. You gotta have expectation. You've got to begin to do this. We, we've become so normal in the church today, but it all starts with us expecting. We need to wake up in the morning saying, God, I expect great things to happen. I expect the supernatural. I expect for you to do great exploits in my life. It's an adventure. So these people were hearing things. They were hearing about lives being changed, people's being saved, people being set free, marriages coming back together. Their pastors who were burned out were coming back to churches on fire for God. Things were breaking out all over. They then said, I got to go. I got to spend time. I'm going to spend money. I don't care what it takes, but I'm going to find out what's going on there. And they stood on lines waiting for services. Six days a week there were services in these churches. Amazing sacrifice these churches, the people in these churches who got revival first, they were the ones that were there serving people as they came in, wanting to turn them on to God and his power. And so six nights a week, long services, they didn't shut the lights out because they had a little schedule. People were there. If you needed prayer, you'd be there two, three in the morning. You stayed as long as you needed prayer. People were on the floor. People were just getting touched and and then we went out to restaurants afterwards and it continued to go on in the restaurants so i just want to show you the expectation i want you to get this in your spirit this expectation of what god's going to do today so let's just watch these this clip it's, this is smithton pour down from the skies on every heart oh. There are services five days a week at Smithton. It's not uncommon to find people from across America visiting this small town church to experience this outpouring. A simple walk through the parking lot proved to us the fact that Americans are hungry for revival and will travel many miles to experience this outpouring. I've been here a few times and just every time I come, God just is here in just a marvelous way and we drive from Springfield and it doesn't seem like anything to drive two hours be where you know God's gonna show up and speak to you and he just the way he moves it's just it's really wonderful it's really did, anointing. Did you ever think you'd, you'd come to a place like this travel two hours just for a meeting? It doesn't well probably not especially not a little town like this but it it just seems so right to me to come now because I'm, I don't get tired of driving out here I, I get tired of um, I got tired of not experiencing God. I got tired of being the way I was before I started coming here. I don't get tired of driving out here, no. Is this your first time? Yes, yes it is. Well, what do you, what do you, what do you expect is going to happen to you tonight? 
Well, I, I, every time I go to church, I have a good experience with the Lord. So this is Friday night. My brother said this was the place to be. So here I am. Out of curiosity, what, what did your brother say is happening? Here? He said there's a great outpouring of the Lord's Spirit in Smithville. Okay, what brings you here? I came uh, just to glorify the Lord, and I'm excited to be here. Um, I've had a lot happen since the grace vis visited my church in Stillwater, and the Lord has delivered me from antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication and he's lifted a burden off of me that I carried for a long time um, and my family and I came tonight and I told them in the car what we need to say is Lord whatever you need to do in us do it and we've just come expecting the Lord to do even more. Do you really believe something's going to happen to you and your family yes, tonight? Yes, yes. <laughs> I just pray right now I just pray that God like she said whatever you want to do Lord do it. We give you permission whatever you want to do in our hearts tonight including me, I pray you'll do it. Brownsville, oh man, what a scene. I went there, people be waiting in the early morning to go, and it was hot in Florida, man. It was, they were going through the heat, they were waiting all day long for a 7 p.m. meeting. I want the clip to speak for itself, but I'm telling you, I experienced it, it was amazing, that they would wait online, then there would be these flash thunderstorms and all. Listen to this, watch what happened in Brownsville. A comprehensive documentary on the Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, Florida. Since Father's Day, June 18th, 1995, over three and a half million have come from every state and many nations to experience this mighty move of God. You would find hundreds waiting in line early each morning, anxiously awaiting the 7 p.m. service. What time did you get here this morning? We got here at 3.15. A.M. in the morning? In the morning. What time is the service tonight? It'll be at 7 o'clock. P.M., you mean, in the evening? P.M., yep. Why? Why did you get here so early? For the glory of God. What time did you get here this morning? About 3.15. 3.15 in the morning? Yes. Wow. And how have you ever been here before? The last couple of days. Tell me what you think of the Browns Revival. It's awesome. And what did you come for? We came for the presence of God. It's just been awesome. I, it was beyond what I had anticipated, and he's just awesome here. His presence is just incredible. It comes in like the tide, and you can feel it, and he's just so real. You say, why would people have to travel so far to experience God? That should be something we should be doing in our churches, in our homes. But you see, there's a problem. And there's a problem that we have because we've gotten into what my people Israel did. They had a form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. It's like a repetition now. The church today is exactly it. And they had an unbelief. And we see this happening, but so encouraging to see what God did there. I want you to experience now a little bit of this, a little taste of this. When you would walk into these churches, there would be this worship, this ecstatic worship going on. I mean, these people were jumping, jumping in Toronto. You're going to see Toronto. You're going to see a little bit of Smithton. You're going to see then Brownsville. And I want you to just experience when you walked into that electricity. And I mean, you're walking in and you kind of come from your sleepy church. You might even have had a good church. But man, when you walked in there, it was like, Oh my gosh, you just didn't want to leave. So what I'd like you to do for this little segment is get up and be a participant. If you don't know the word, but just start worshiping God. And we just want to get a little bit of worship in here, but let's worship to the same revival music that was played back then in these revivals. Help me when I go. 
love your grace. I love your grace. I love your mercy. I love the way you help me when I go. I love the truth. I love the power of your name. But you know I love your presence most of all. Oh, my soul takes refuge in you. My soul takes refuge in the shadow of your wings. Close to you is where I want to be. You are my strength. You are my God. You are my King. And all I want is what you want for me. You could sit down if you can. We got more. But you see, did you see the young people in there? Young people on fire, you know? Old people on fire. Everybody's on fire. But there was testimonies and things happening. People running to the altars getting saved. People who are backslidden getting saved. Getting on fire with God. There were people being delivered, set free and healed. One testimony after another. You could see why those people were excited. We got to get excited because that's coming. That's coming into your life tonight. That's going to be, this is going to be a beginning of a thing in your life. You'll never be the same. 
After eight years of my being immersed in this, I can't be the same. I was messed up. Sid's fault. Sid Ross' fault. But I'm still being challenged by Sid because he's still pressing in. And all of these guys that I know who have been in this and who have go been going after God, they're still going after God. They're saying there's got to be more. There's got to be more. There's a hunger. I hope you're getting this hunger and this expectation welling up inside you by the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit will plant these seeds of expectation for tonight, for today, not tomorrow, today. One of the things that was incredible in Toronto that I found and all of these revivals were the nations were coming. You talk about Jesus' prayer that they might be one. It was happening. Now, that can't happen. You know, we can't even get two political parties in this country to agree upon anything. We have problems with husbands and wives. Right? I mean, trying to agree. When you get Jew and Gentile, Baptist, Catholics, you get the nations coming together, young and old, black and white, and they're coming together and they're just worshiping God. There's something going on that's beyond the natural. Right? And I want to show you this incredible thing. This this will give you the best idea of what was going on. They had people that were translating booths. They had things for people from different nations to hear it in their languages, in Brownsville, in Smithton, and in Toronto. Watch this. This is incredible. So be it, oh God. Between the black and the white, between the Hispanic and the Asian, those walls, yes, they're coming down. Between the Jew and the Gentile, and all the nations, those walls, they're coming. Between the men and the women, between the father and his children, those walls, yes, they're coming down. Between the young and the old, and the traditions grow cold, yes, those walls, they're coming. now for that unity that you could only bring by your Holy Spirit. Oh God, we yearn for that unity, Lord God. We're black people, white people, people from the nations come together to worship you, Lord God. Oh God, where there's no barriers. Lord God, Jesus broke down the middle wall of the partition to make a way that we could be one to come into the throne room of God. Oh God, why do we keep erecting walls? Oh God, 
break the walls. I pray for break dividing walls. Let's all say that right now. Break dividing walls, Lord. Break dividing walls in the name of Yeshua. Break the barriers down right now in Yeshua's name. Woo. You know, Jesus especially, when he walked the earth, he didn't go to the chosen frozen churches, the synagogues. He didn't go. He went out to the people. And who were the ones that got their miracle? Who were the ones that got their breakthrough? It was the hurting, the needy, the hungry, the desperate, who knew they needed a savior, who knew they needed God. See, we walk around blind. We walk around thinking we're rich. We need to understand that God reaches us when we understand who we really are. When we look at our estate, when we look at ourselves in the mirror and we're true, and we say, God, I need you. Think of the Jairus, an elder of the synagogue. He had a lot to lose when he came to Jesus. Now, he came in the midst of the throngs. He was preaching to the multitudes. So this ruler of the synagogue comes up, and it was, Jesus was radical. And he fell at Jesus' feet, begging him to heal his dying daughter. And Jesus, by the time he got to Jairus' home, the little girl had already died. Now, I don't know about you, but when death comes in the natural, there's no more hope. I mean, it's over. You prayed the prayer. You were hoping that that person would pull through. Death comes, and it's over. There is no more hope for you in the natural. Correct? And so there were mourners outside crying. You see them. You ever see the Middle East? professional mourners, you know? And here it is, Jairus must have felt horrible. Oh my gosh, I blew it all and my daughter's dead and I went to this guy, Jesus, and now I'm troubled with my life. You know what? His heart might have been pure because I think he was just Greek. Jesus saw his tears. Jesus knew what the moment was good. The father already revealed it to Jesus, what he was gonna do. And so there he is, he goes into the room and Jesus took the girl by the hand and, just, and simply said, little girl, arise. And he said, give her something to eat, right? I mean, Jairus had everything to lose that this world could offer, respect, the position of stature. But when his daughter was dying, nothing mattered. She had to be healed. That's all he could think about. She had to be healed. I don't know about you, but there's times we just got to get desperate for God. You know, we got to wake up with this holy desperation. Say, God, there's more. There's so much more. We reduce Christianity to something where it's just like, oh, well, the experience that we happened when we first got born again. And you know what? For most of us, a lot of us, that experience, that testimony has been robbed by Satan. A few divorces later or husbands leaving wives and all kinds of stuff and, you know, backsliddenness and all kinds of stuff. And our testimonies have been robbed. Listen, he wants to give you new manna every day. The King James says the old manna doth stinketh. It does stinketh. He wants to give us new, new one. But we have to have this expectant heart. We have to have this hunger inside of us. We have to see the sad state and say, oh, God, I need you. I want you. I can't live my life this way anymore. I think about the woman that was sitting with the Pharisees who came in with an alabaster box, an, an ointment, and she couldn't even face Jesus. And the Pharisees, look, first of all, women wouldn't be allowed to come into the area where men were meeting. And she just slipped in there. She didn't care. She was getting cold stares from that Pharisee, but all she could do is be at Jesus' feet and anoint his feet with, his, with her tears and with the oil. And she would, she would wipe it off with her hair. And meanwhile, Jesus is having a conversation with these Pharisees. I'm sure they're going like, what's going on here? This lady's like worshiping at his feet. And they tried to condemn her and all. But Jesus, at one moment, here it is. He, he, he looked at her and she had a look at him. And all of a sudden, she was looking into the eyes of God. Now, Moses was told, if you saw the face of God, you would surely die. 
But when she looked in the face of Jesus and he said, your sins are forgiven you, she lived. Amen. See, God brought Yeshua, the living word. He brought him for us so we could understand his compassion, his love. We could then have a palatable way that we could see his face. And we could understand who he is. And we could see the face of God. And we could see God in action. And we could know what the word says. When, the word, when he spoke, it was the word of God speaking. When he touched someone, it was God touching someone. And that's what God wants us to understand. Now, I want to show you something. I'm going to show you Kathy and Steve Grave from Smithton. They were in trouble. Kathy, just before Steve left for Brownsville, you were experiencing your worst nightmare. Oh, Sid, it, it was it was like a nightmare. It really was. It was everything that every wife and every pastor's wife dreads. And what, what I was living was seeing the collapse of my husband, of his life, of his personality, of everything that he was, uh, seeing the destruction of his dreams, of his vision, of his hope. And when you're seeing your husband live through that, there's hardly anything you can do after a while. I tried to give him all the right words, you know, all the encouragement, the pats on the back, the, come on, hun, honey, buck up. You can do it. You can do it. But on the inside, I was starting to crumble. As I watched him sink lower and lower, I just found um, a deep fear. And she'd say, well, I don't think God's finished with you yet. And I'd think, well, I don't care. Maybe I'm finished with me. I'm finished. I'm tired of people. Uh, I'm tired of the destruction. I'm, I'm tired of, of, of being afraid. Uh, and pastors will know what I'm talking about. A little bit afraid. There's always somebody's after your life looking to say, aha, aha, I knew there was something wrong with you. And so I started having thoughts. I want to just disappear. How can I get out of this? How can I get out smoothly without hurting these people, without hurting this ministry? Maybe God will send somebody in to take over. Or maybe I'll just disappear, take all my money out of the bank. I won't even tell Kathy. I've got some money saved up. I'll go get cash. They were in trouble. Twelve years they were in this little town of 538. They'd given their all as a pastor and a wife. And you know what he said? He felt like that woman that had an issue of blood for 12 years. Could you identify with that? draining, weak, feeling an issue of blood for 12 years. Some of you have been feeling like that in your spiritual lives. You feel like you've been draining. You feel like you've been just totally, you know, depleted. You're in trouble that way. And you're, you're putting on the face. You're going to church with the halo on your head, but you're feeling it inside tonight. There's some of you going through this tonight. I know. I know because I was going through that. I was, I, I thought, you know, I put on a good show, but man, until I hit these revivals, I didn't realize how desperate and how needy I was. But they were going through this horrible thing in their marriage, and there was no hope. They had to find some place to go. Had this next thing not happened, they wouldn't have found the place. Because Steve Gray had to go to a place called Brownsville, where a revival was taking place. He had to go to that place to receive revival. He couldn't find it in his own church. As a matter of fact, when he was up there at the pulpit, his last sermon was about the woman with the issue of blood. And he said, that woman, she just zoned in and said, I need a miracle. I need a miracle. I don't care that I'm not supposed to approach a man, especially a rabbi especially when she had an issue of blood because the Torah said that someone had an issue of blood. The blood was so sacred that God didn't want any contact when a woman had an issue of blood. And yet she said, if I could only touch his garment. Are you that hungry? Steve Gray was at this point where he had to go and touch the garment. He, he didn't care if it was a scrap, just something for hope. Kathy Gray, his wife, go to Brownsville. I've been to revivals before. Honey, go away. Get away. Get alone with God. I'll take care of things at the church. You need to go. And he gets up and says this message. I feel like that woman, 12 years issue of blood. 
he closed his Bible and walked off with no ministry and started driving to Brownville. But had John Kilpatrick not been a man of hunger, a man of desperation, there wouldn't have been a Brownsville revival. Watch this. Before revival broke out, friend, in this church, there was times I came down to this church and I would lay on the front row behind those chairs. There was no chairs up here then. I'd lay on the front row. And I'd come down here some morning, just put on a pair of sweatpants, never cut the lights on. And I'd hit the security system in the back and let myself in and lock the door behind me. Three or four o'clock in the morning. Something deep inside of me was calling out to the deep of God. And I said, Lord, there's got to be more. And I would come in here in this building and I would scare myself, friend. It was the stillness of that dark pre-dawn hours. Four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, and I'd lay on that front row and I'd grab my belly and bellow out like a cow. Oh, God! I need you, Lord! John Kilpatrick would go into his church and he would just say, Oh, God, there's got to be more. God, I can't take it anymore. Oh, God, there's got to be more. He would be walking the dark church and saying, Oh, God, thank you for this church. Thank you for the people. But, oh, God, I'm dying here. There's got to be more. Exactly like that. And he would go night after night just crying out to God. Nobody understood it. But he had this thing in him saying, God, I read in the Bible of people running forward. They're getting saved, delivered. Where is it? We're just changing church membership. Oh, God, I'm dying here. I need more. Do you have that desperation in your heart? Are you starting to sense that in you? You understand what I'm talking about? It's like getting serious with God, not playing church. It's like saying, oh, God, I can't live this way anymore. I know there's better for this family that I live in, for myself, for this nation, for the world. Oh, God, where are you, God? Where are you? Oh, Lord, I just pray for that, that hunger to well up inside of us right now like John Kilpatrick had, that hunger inside for more of you, that hunger, Lord God, for, for, your, for your glory to come, for you to kiss this place that we live in, God, to touch us in a great way. Oh, God, we want to be supernatural. We want to be walking in the supernatural of God. Lord God, we want to be those ambassadors. We want to be those sons and daughters of the Most High God going after you. When we go to people, let them see you in us, God. Yes, Lord God. Yes, Lord God. That's the cry of our hearts. That's the cry of our hearts. I'd like you to get up again and just worship. This is, this is the type of worship that they get in. And we're just going to worship to this and just enter in from this type of worship. Just as, this is just going to tenderize our hearts because you know what? The atmosphere of God is in worship. It comes and kisses down. The presence of God begins to come and dwell amongst us. He inhabits the praises of his people. Sovereign Lord is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news. The Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon you because he has anointed you to preach good news. I send you to the poor to bind 
I was close to you I knew the sound of your mighty voice I knew your strength I knew your power your presence every hour but a memory just won't do anymore one more time let me know that you love me Sing to 
I believe that he's preparing his bride to be worshipers. We have not been worshipers in the past. The church in America has not been a worshiping church. We call worship service Sunday morning at 11 a.m., but very little worship happens happens. Most of the time we sit and listen to the choir and go, isn't that nice? If you look at what's in Revelation as a snapshot of what is going on in heaven that is really worship, that little thing we do on Sunday morning is hardly worship. You know? And I think what God has been doing with this revival and what the ministry of worship has been doing is getting us to focus on heaven and what's going on there and the kind of worship as the Lord said, He's looking across the face of the earth, looking for people who will worship Him. Lord, who am I compared to your glory? Oh, Lord. Lord, who am I compared to your majesty? It seems to me that the world is hungry for worship that's about Jesus, for music that has passion, for music that, you know, that brings the glory of the Lord. Because I have a feeling the lost and the heathen, and even some of the heathen and lost that are sitting on our church pews in, in suits on Sunday morning, if the glory of the Lord will come, it'll change. And that's what these revival services at Brownsville have been about. The glory of God coming and changing us and transforming us into looking more like Jesus and reflecting Him better. Praise the Lord. want you boy to come in our churches. Oh God, come, we need you. We need you. You could be seated. You could be seated. Now, I want to tell you, that Brownsville revival you just saw, it makes me laugh sometimes. I had this pastor once say to me, I want revival to be in my church, Warren. And he said, but I don't want none of that weird stuff. <laughs> and I did everything I could to hold back laughing, and it wasn't holy laughter. <laughs> it was because... When, if you want God to come in your life, don't put any restrictions on him. I'm telling you, don't put any restrictions on him. I'm going to give you a little bit of my testimony before I show you what happened in the Brownsville church. I went with Sid, and I'm there in Toronto, and I'm seeing things that weren't decently in order in my little mind. You know, all kinds of stuff, and you're going to see some of that stuff. But anyway, 
I just got so hungry because I saw lives being changed. And I kept watching people, and I saw all this radical stuff happening, and I was saying, God, God, if you're here, I want it. I want you to do something in me so I don't leave the same as I entered in. So I stood in those crazy prayer lines, and as I'm standing there, I'm getting ready. But I said one thing to God, just don't let me get that shaking stuff. See, I had seen these people that were like this. And I said to Sid, I was sitting with Sid Roth, and I said, Sid, do they have a lot of healings here? He goes, why do you ask? I said, seems like they got a lot of people with cerebral palsy or something. You know? <laughs> like this. He says, that's just what, something that happens sometimes when the glory comes upon people. Their bodies just can't contain it. Hey, you want to go up for some prayer? I finally got the guts to go up. I said, God, don't give me that shaking stuff because I can't see myself going back to Lynchburg, Virginia, saying, hi, Jerry. I'm here to produce the old time gospel hour. So I'm standing on the line and I'm standing there and one person after another, more radical than the next. They're just, and all they're doing is these are just lay people that are just, who've got revived. They're going, more, Lord, more. Just keep coming, Holy Spirit. Fill them up. More, Lord, more. Whoa! Okay, Lord. And then another person falls down on the ground. Another person rolling around. You know, I'm going, okay, this is going to be good. Because I know that I'm protected because I ask God not. So they come and pray. More, Lord, more. More, Lord, more. More, Lord, more. Nothing. I don't feel nothing. And I'm going, what is this? Is this just like people just getting emotional? And then the next guy over me goes, Whoa! birthing hoo, 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 like a baby on the ground and I'm going even if they were making this up you wouldn't want to look like an idiot like that guy's looking that's what I'm saying in my mind I mean why would you want to do that I mean a Hollywood writer couldn't come up with the stuff I was seeing so then I started saying God I don't care what you do I don't care if I stand on my head I don't care if you do so I just want you God I just want you. I can't leave here without you. And I started getting desperate and hungry for God. And you know what God did? As I'm just worshiping and I'm just standing there, I started seeing my people, Israel. I saw these rabbinical Jews. They're, they're at the railing wall and they're going, oh, God. And I say, God, why are they doing that? And he said, they're, they're begging God that his temple might be rebuilt, that his glory might come and dwell among them. And they're saying, oh, God, heal my wife of cancer. Oh, God, bring my child back to you. Oh, God, I need you. I need you. And then all of a sudden, it was like I was transported into churches. And I saw people singing hymns. And there was empty looks in their faces. And they were saying, oh, God, where are you? Oh, my husband has left me. Oh, God, where are you? I'm dying of cancer. Oh, God, can't you heal me? Oh, God, help me. Help me. And as I started seeing it, and I saw that the church was in the same state as Israel was when Yeshua, Jesus, came and walked the earth, these tears started flowing out of me like a faucet I couldn't turn off. And I got so embarrassed because I was just weeping and sobbing. And I just laid on the floor on my stomach, hiding my face, just going like this. Hours and hours, three days, I was just weeping and weeping and weeping and weeping. And it's one of the reasons, on, on the floor, it's when I heard God say, I want you to film this. I want you to show the world what I'm doing here. That's where I got the vision to do the things. And it just came together. And here we are releasing it to the world to, right now. Right now. But I want to show you something. See, it doesn't come like you think it was. John Kilpatrick was a pastor, a very controlling pastor. He was the type of pastor of an Assemblies of God church that if somebody was getting out of order, he just went like this. And when he looked, they knew where he was. His deacons came, his elders, they, they came and escorted the ushers, came and escorted the guy out. That's the type of pastor he was. He had everything, you know, decently in order. I want you to watch what happened on the day that the Brownsville revival broke out. Didn't come like he thought it would. When I call folks forward, you know, I don't know, 500 to 1,000, I don't know, but it was a lot of people came down. And John Kilpatrick looked at that, and he told me later he was just, I mean, in a way, he was ticked. I mean, it was like, this is Father's Day, get real. 
We're not going to lay hands on all these people. On Father's Day, they want to go to lunch. And when I saw those people come forward for prayer, it made me mad. Because I said to myself, dear God, Steve, it's Father's Day, man. Let these people go home and have lunch with their daddies, you know. Good grief, we got to pray for these people now. And I remember he just leapt off the platform like a gazelle. You know, he just jumped off like a deer out there and among the people. And he came up to this guy and started praying for him. And I was sitting here in my chair. And I, I got to thinking to myself, well, I guess I better go help him. You know, I didn't want to help him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, Lord, more, 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 Jesus. Now, Lord, fire, 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 fire. Now, now, Jesus, fire. When I stepped down off the platform, began praying for people, I remember the power was just coming down. I mean, people were being touched by the power of God. And that was a sign to me that, you know, God was going to move, He was moving, that there was something to this uh, more than just Father's Day morning. And I remember it when I stood up, I bet if you, if you had a camera on me and could look at me, I just had that look on me. I didn't want to be here. I didn't want to see His excitement. I didn't want him praying for me, you know. And I, I imagine when I stood up, my shoulders were probably rounded. I was probably stooped. I just sort of moped across the platform. And on the way across the platform, I thought to myself, well, I guess I better put on my preacher face, you know, my spiritual face. And I remember I walked off the platform, walked off the steps that morning, and Steve was praying for a man. And when I walked across this platform before God, I did not know that in a matter of seconds, my life, this church, and my ministry, and everything was going to change. I had no idea. And my husband heard a sound when they were down there. They were just down there a few minutes, and he heard this sound, and he thought something was wrong with the sound equipment, and he looked up, and all of a sudden, one of those suddenlies that God has, this river, we call it the river of God, just came right through his legs and his ankles went out and he just thought, Lord, what is this? And Tony, one of the men, saw him and he saw he was in distress and he said, Pastor, do you need help? And he said, yeah, help me on the platform. So he walked him up as best he could to the platform and by the time my husband got to the platform, he knew that this was God. And you see, God always comes to the headship first. If the pastor doesn't want this move of God, he will not come. It has to come through the pastor. And when my husband made a declaration and said, folks, this is it, get in. This is what we've been praying for for two and a half years. This is God. When he said that, it was like all oh, heaven just came down. And my husband just fell out in the spirit right on the steps where I saw him in the dream. And when I said that, I fell right here behind the podium and I hit my head, my head just bounced on that hard marble floor. I remember it bouncing. And I hit and it felt like I instantly weighed 10,000 pounds. It felt just like I weighed 10,000 pounds. And I tried, I struggled to get my head up off the floor and my neck was sore for two or three days after that. I struggled so hard to get my head up and I couldn't even get my head up. But it wasn't scary. It didn't feel claustrophobic, nothing like that. It felt like that God had just pulled a big quilt up over me and tucked me in and kissed me and said, no, just lay here. Your pastor's out for the count, by the way. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> and I Friends, knew when I saw that, I was, I was almost in shock. Stay with us. I mean, I, I saw him laying on that platform. He was right in front of me. He had fallen right in front of me on, on the platform. And I, I was almost in a shock because I thought, Wow, you know, this has got to be real, you know, because he's always been a man of control and he's always been a man of order and God has done this and it only can be God. I remember he was so drunk. I, I, I'm just going to go ahead and say that, drunk in the spirit. He couldn't hardly lift. I remember when he fell on that floor, I remember I looked at him and he, he, he was just laid out. He had his arms out and I remember his, his hand was like this and he, had, and he did his pinky just like that. I was looking at him and I saw his pinky move and I'm like, what is, what is he trying to do here? You know, he's just out cold. And, uh, but I saw his pinky move and I said, well, I guess he wants me to come over there to him. And so I walk up to him and he goes, wet my lips. 
wet my lips. He couldn't even lick his lips. He was so drunk. And so I had to go get some water, get a handkerchief, and dab his lips for him. He was so out of it. And we took it one day at a time. And we asked, if we'd asked the congregation, how many want a, another service the next day? And they'd go, you know, they'd go, yes. Will you be here? Yes. Will you bring a friend? Well, I'll try to. And, and so we took it one day at a time. And days turned into weeks, turned into months, turned into years. And here we are. And I know that preachers around America and around the world are dying like I was to hear about life in their churches and to hear it come in because within ourselves we can't help people. I can't. But when that comes in, your problems, as far as sterility and deadness, your problems are over. You see, God had to take him out of the way. And for six months, John Kilpatrick, the pastor that was in total control, he would sit up on the platform in his pastor's seat, and he'd be like, if he had a pillow like this, he'd be drooling. The head of the Assemblies of God would come in. Now, let me tell you something. If you're playing games, you don't do that in front of the head of the Assemblies of God. He'd come in, and they said he didn't care because he was so out of it. His son said, there were times where you wouldn't be all right, Dad. He'd have to try to dress his dad and mom. They were so out of it. And he said, you all right, Dad? He goes, yeah, yeah, you, you could just go to church. I'll be all right. And then his son, who you saw there, would call him and say, Dad, where are you? And he goes, I've been trying to put my socks on for the last hour. <laughs> <laughs> now, you say, oh, is that God? Now, listen, self-control, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, it's talking about self-control not to sin. It's not talking about the Holy Spirit and what you need. And what I learned is to stop judging. Because when I was in Toronto, I saw things that were happening. And I was judging it. And then when I talked with people and found out, if you are ready to put a gun to your head like one man was who was laughing, and I was trying to figure out, why is this guy laughing, man? Guy's preaching the cross and this guy's laughing? I went over to him and I said, what's going on? He said, before revival, I had a gun to my head and I was ready to shoot myself. So when a guy gets healed of suicidal depression, he begins to laugh. It doesn't last forever, but he's being delivered. If a person is crippled, right, and Jesus healed him, he didn't just go, well, thank you, Jesus. He went, yeah, praise God. He would be leaping and dancing and praising God. Isn't that the way it is in the Bible? Now, if John Kilpatrick didn't go after God, we left Steve and Kathy Gray with their problem. There would not have been a Brownsville for him to go to. He went into that revival. At first, he just said, I couldn't, I couldn't take it. There's people so happy. I was miserable. And he even sat in his hotel room during the day before the meetings. And he would sit there, and the room service would come and knock on a door. Boom, 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 boom. Room service. And he'd go, go away. <laughs> That's how miserable he was. But something happened. He got this hope inside of him. He went forward to the altar. He repented of everything he could think of. And I want to show you what happened when he returned from the Brownsville Revival, the little church of Smithton, Missouri, broke out in revival. Watch this. A miracle. It was a miracle. It was the Lord breaking through and answering all my prayers and, and bringing all my dreams back into focus. I saw my little husband walk in that same room into the door, through the door that he'd walked through for 12 years. And the music was already going and we were already worshiping the Lord by faith. And when he walked in, it was 6, 12 p.m. I looked at my watch because he was late. I hadn't seen him for two weeks, and I, I wanted to know if the Lord was going to save us or not. I knew this was crucial. I knew this moment when he walked in was the determining moment of the rest of our lives. And I lit up like a ball. I, mean, I just lit up. My eyes, my mouth, my grin. I'm smiling. My wife hadn't, when the last time my wife had seen me, I looked horrible. And I lit up with this grin, and, and it struck me like lightning, and there was no outlet for it. It came in. How do I let it out? I did something I'd never done before, and both arms went up in the air, and I just started jumping up and down. That's the only thing. It just had to come out. The power of God hit him, 
and he responded instantly. His whole countenance just lifted. His eyes got real big, and this free grin came on his face like I'd never seen him grin before. It was the kind of freedom that I'd always wanted for him. And he started doing something that he's, he'd never done before. He put both his hands straight up in the air, and he, he had this big grin, and he started just kind of bouncing and jumping and twirling. And when that happened, it was like electricity went through him, hit all of our people. It's a miracle what happened. Everyone ran down to the front of our little old sanctuary where the floor is very old because it was built in 1859, this floor. We all crammed down to the front and everyone started doing that, just leaping for joy. And a new life had come in. The presence of God was there. And I knew that we were on our way to a new beginning. We'll never be the same. The Lord So there's that incredible thing. One person goes after God, something happens, and it affects another person. That's what we're talking about here tonight. We're talking about here about you getting it, you being a fire starter, you affecting the destiny of other people. Now, what did Steve Gray do? He felt like he was drained 12 years. If I could just touch the hem of his garment. Are you that hungry to say, oh, God, just give me a little morsel. Oh, God, I'm so desperate. I just want a little bit, a little bit of you. I want to tell you, in these revivals, there were people who had gone to a church for a long time. Their fathers were pastors, and they were going, man, I didn't really know God. I want to show you Mrs. Broxson and her testimony real quickly. Before the revival, I loved the Lord with all my heart. Uh, at least I thought it was with all my heart. I have been in the church all my life. My dad is, is a pastor. But there was something missing. I mean, I read my Bible, but yet there was, there was a void there. And I knew I had a call in my life, but I, I didn't know exactly what it was. And it, like I said, there was, there was a void, even though I loved the Lord. And I didn't know what it was. Uh, and I was really, really beginning to dry up inside. And I said, God, I need you. When I went to the first service that Sunday night, I was so hungry. I was at the point where I was yelling to God, you've got to do something in my life or I'm going to wither away. You've got to move. And I guess coming to that point, surrendering, and really getting a hold of God. You've got to do this. And the moment came. And I was going. I was so hungry, so hungry. I went up to the altar every night. I was getting prayer every night. And my family, the girls, dove in. The boys were a little bit skeptic. They didn't, they didn't quite understand. And, and my husband didn't quite understand, even though he loves the Lord with all of his heart. They all do, but I was coming in very late, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning. I was so, so hungry. God had to move in me in order for him to start moving in the rest of the family. And it brought a lot of tension between my husband and I, mostly on my husband's part, because he didn't understand. And I was, and I was questioned. I said, God, how can he not understand when you're moving? How can he question this? Doesn't he know that it's of you? I really felt the spirit rising up in me. And I said, I love you, but I have got to have God right now. He is calling me, and I'm going after him. I'm doing this. I have got to do this. But there was one moment that when I came home and I hugged my husband and God moved, just broke that wall and moved in him and it changed him where he, now he could start understanding and could see what was going on and gave him a hunger also. See, it takes one, one to go after God 
Actually, you prophesy of your future by what you do today. If you sit in your seat of complacency, the prophecy that you're saying is it's either going to be as bad as it is today or worse tomorrow. But if you start going after God, after all, what does it say in the great commandment? To love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with everything that's within you. Boy, like so many scriptures, we just read it. To love the Lord thy God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength. And all you got to do is love your neighbors as yourself. It's simple. Jesus just made it very simple. How do I do that? And am I doing it? See, to love the Lord thy God, it's deep. It's like, it's like having this love affair with God, and it's like walking with him and talking with him and spending time in his presence and going into the throne boldly that Jesus won that way that we could get in and broke that veil, tore that veil in half. The veil was his flesh that we could go into the Holy of Holies. We read that like there's just words. He's seated at the right hand of the Father on the mercy seat. And when the father sees you, he looks at you through the nail scarred hands of his son and he sees you complete. He sees you the new creation that he's made you to be and we're trying to become on this earth. You got to realize that there are things that happen in these revivals that have happened through history. And you read in even the Bible in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 7, we read when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, the Shekinah glory. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down, see, they saw it. And the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worship and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good. Listen to this. For his mercy endures forever. See, when God's glory comes, it's the mercy cloud. Because he turns away from us and where we are and our backsliddenness. He turns away from how far we've gone from him. He turns away from our desperate state and he hears our cries and he comes to us and he says, I love you. Come to me, my child. I love you. Come to me and spend time with me. When was the last time you said, Daddy, God, I love you? When was the last time you said, Daddy, you come in the throne room, you get on his lap, and you say, Daddy, God, I love you. Abba, Daddy, God, I love you. When was the last time we said that? It's, 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 it's incredible. That's what revival is all about. And revival, so you know, it's speaking of something horrible. It's saying that the patient is dying or comatose. That's what has to be revived. That's the state of the church. And if we don't see ourselves as comatose and dying, then you're not going to have revival because you're just going to stay in that state. Now, listen, Jonathan Edwards of the Great Awakening. See, they cleaned this history up. How many like that revival? Oh, if we could only have a great awakening. Listen to this. It was very wonderful to see how persons' affections were sometimes moved. I love the way they say to see, this is like King Jamish, you know. It's kind of like... The way they'd write it now would be more like the inquirer, you know, type thing. But when, go when God did as it were suddenly open their eyes and let into their minds a sense of greatness of his grace, the fullness of Christ and his readiness to save. Listen to what happened. Their joyful surprise has caused their hearts, as it were, to leap so that they have been ready to break forth into laughter. Uh-oh. Laughter, tears often at the same time, issuing like a flood, weeping uncontrollably. Oh, that's not God. And loud weeping. Oh, God. Imagine that happening in your church with all kinds of people wailing. It was a very frequent thing to see a house full of outcries, faintings, convulsions. <laughs> And such the like, both with distress and also with admiration and joy. 
many in their religious affections, being raised far beyond what they have ever had before, remaining for perhaps a whole 24 hours motionless, blasted on the floor, and with their senses locked up, but in the meantime, under strong imagination. In other words, they're having visions and dreams, as though they went to heaven and had there a vision of glorious and delightful objects. Don't you love that, the way they wrote in those days? The Cane Ridge Revival in Kentucky. This is an atheist writing this. An atheist, okay? The noise was like the roar of Niagara. The vast sea of human beings seemed to be agitated as if by a storm. Some of the people were singing, others praying, some crying for mercy in the most piteous accents. While witnessing these scenes, a peculiarly strange sensation such as I have never felt before came over me. This is an atheist, right? My heart started beating tumultuously. My knees trembled, my lip quivered, and I felt as though I must fall to the ground. A strange supernatural power seemed to pervade the entire mass of mind there collected. At one time, I saw at least 500 swept down in a moment as if a battery of a 1,000 guns had been opened on them, and then immediately followed shrieks and shouts that rent the very heavens. We're talking about revival, folks. Now, just in case you well, those wacky Pentecostal types. Methodist revival, John Wesley. John Wesley recognized falling to the ground as manifestation from God and records many such instances in his ministry. In fact, George Whitful, who criticized Wesley for permitting the phenomenon until it became, began happening in his own meetings. And last of all, Dwight L. Moody. Anybody know Dwight L. Moody? People fell to the floor under the power of God, wept openly, on and on and on, okay? So I want to show you this. When the glory falls, the impossible becomes possible. For compassion in our heart, Lord, for the loss, for prophetic evangelism, Lord, for your people, in the streets, Lord, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, Lord. Touch her being, Lord, touch her. Doctor, how has this affected your practice? Well, the patients I see primarily are suffering from mood problems, mood swings, concentration problems, and tremendous emotional bondage. And what, had, what convinced me that I needed to look into this renewal myself was when I saw people come free very suddenly or very rapidly. Uh, people were coming free emotionally at a speed that I had never seen before in my life. I think a lot of people watching this are asking, is this revival real? Yes, there's no doubt in my, in my mind, this is the most significant move of God I've ever seen in my life. In the last three years, I have seen more emotional healings and transformations of people's spiritual life and emotional life than I've ever seen before. Then something happened that in all my years as a filmmaker had never occurred before. We were interviewing a couple from South Africa when all of a sudden the power of God fell. Watch this. This is a very normal couple but the husband was very shy and wasn't sure he wanted to do the interview. But as we talked, pow, the power of God fell. Let me ask you something. I notice you people are having fun here. Oh, yes! <laughs> could, you, could you answer me? What, what, are you, what are you feeling here? What are you, what's going on? Oh, it's hot. <laughs> what's going on with you? Oh, oh it's like... Inside. Ooh. What are you, are you in pain? <laughs> What's going on? Happiness. <laughs> oh, 
love. Oh, oh, oh. I actually came for her. <laughs> <laughs> To be honest, I was stunned. No one was praying for these people. There was no enthusiastic praise and worship going on. Basically, nothing was happening, so no one could accuse them of being caught up in an emotional frenzy. It had to be supernatural. Let me show you what happened next. What happened? Just tell me your marriage. Just... Oh, we had a bad marriage. We were m living together. From day one, it was like a hurricane. It hits us bad. It was at st one stage so bad, I want to kill him. I want to destroy him. I want to destroy all his things. I killed all his things. If I could find something of him, I burned it, I broke it. I chased him around with knives. The marriage counselors all told us, there's no ways. You got something in you that nobody can get out. And he told me, I can get it out with Jesus in me. And it's changed my life. It's changed me so much. I want to I want to burst open. I want to love everybody. I love everybody, even the people in South Africa. Doesn't matter which color, I love them with a passion. And Wim, I'm telling you, this is my big love. <laughs> See, the thing is, the fruit is what you look at, not the manifestation or whatever it is that a person goes through. What is the fruit of it? Are they falling more in love with Jesus? Are they getting more on fire with God? You know, I don't know what it takes, but sometimes it takes that. Look, I know people are going through counseling for different things, and they've been for years. Watch what happens when the glory of God comes. In Smithton, Missouri, I interviewed a woman who was a counselor, a Christian counselor. Listen to what she said about what happened with the people she was dealing with through revival. Jackie, how has revival changed your approach to ministry? I would say the biggest way that it's changed my approach to ministry is there's not near the counseling there used to be. You know, you could spend time, maybe even, you know, six months a year with people counseling them and trying to help them understand the Word of God and, and bring them along. And what we've seen through the revival is just the power of God come down and change those lives in a moment, something you may have taken counseling, you know, six months, and all of a sudden God just manifests and reveals to them and they are instantly changed. And in a revival service, the power of God to come like that and restore, it, it's, it's, it's just tremendous. Well, how has revival changed you? Well, before uh, revival started, I was pretty much a, I guess almost a typical teenager, you know? I mean, I went out and I drank and I, and I just, I did things, you know, that really didn't please God, you know. I didn't even know God. I mean, I knew, I knew he was there, but I didn't really, I didn't love him. I didn't love him. And I started coming to revival services. And God just, God just broke my heart. And he crushes it and crushes it until, until all that, all that hardness and all that worldliness and all that hate that I have for people and for, especially for my mother and, and for and the greed and the selfishness and the me, you know, and he's just taking that out of me and putting into me life, putting into me freedom and I can praise him. <laughs> Aren't you afraid of losing your old friends? I have. <laughs> I've lost them, and, and it's okay because God's just bringing, bringing me people to take places where the people that, people that love God, He's putting those people into my life and giving me new friendships and new relationships. And, it, and I don't want to go back to my old friends because I don't want to do those things anymore. I don't want to do those things that, that aren't pleasing to God. I just want to. I just want to do what He wants me to do. See what I'm talking about? I don't want to do those things I did before. I just want to do the things that please God. Listen, for some of our children, 
for their sake. They can't get out of this thing. There's peer pressure and everything. They need a real experience with God. For their sake, we need revival. But let me tell you something. We're talking about you and me being those catalysts for revival. See, one of the things, thank God that John Kilpatrick, thank God that Steve and Kathy Gray, thank God for John and Carol and not that they were hungry enough as pastors of churches to say, I want more. Oh, God, there's got to be more. But I've taken these clips and gone to Methodist churches, Southern Baptist churches. I've gone to various churches, shows these clips, had an altar call. People got totally on fire for God. I'm telling you the same type of things that you're going to watch in this next clip about what happened on the prayer line happened in these churches. But you know what happened? They went right back to the way they were because there's a Pharisee heresy in the end time church. They are the keepers of the form. And what they is, you can't do anything different because we've been doing it every year the same way. And yes, we've been losing members, but sorry, that's the way it's going to be. So what I'm trying to say through this series and through what we're doing here with this mentoring thing is it's time that people understand Jesus didn't go into the synagogues to preach. He only did it a few times and realized this ain't working. He went to the one. The call is to the one. The call is to the one that's desperate. The call that's to that one, to you, to me, who's desperate enough to take God, to say, God, I'm going for it. Just touch me. Change me. Change my life. Make me different. I don't care what it takes. I don't care. He said, blessed is he that what? leaves families and farms and all kinds of things for my kingdom's sake. I will reward them a hundredfold. There's people, there's pastors afraid of preaching that. What are you preaching about? You want people to start breaking up? No, it's not going to happen. Let me tell you something. Everyone I know that went after, including me, that went after God. My wife was a Catholic. And I hear this Jewish guy that gets saved. She didn't tell me about Jesus. She thought I was Meshuggah. Crazy. <laughs> for a year I went through it with her. She just said, what is this Jesus stuff with you? You know, we had the mayor of Linden, New Jersey, marry us to keep religion out, and you're bringing religion in the home. I got radically saved, transformed, you know? And But she didn't understand it. She should have been telling me about Jesus. Where the action happens in your own home won't be because of great preaching. I'm telling you, when I interviewed these people whose lives were changed, the healings, it didn't, they, I said, how did it happen? They didn't say, well, the music was really good. And it was good music. They didn't say, that sermon by Steve Hill or the sermon by Steve Gray was really great. And they were great. They're better than most sermons you'll ever hear in any church today. What they said was, when I got on the prayer lines, when I went before God and spent time just soaking in his presence. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that tarry with God shall find him, right? When I was on that, that's when God touched me and changed my life. Let's just look at that action. This could happen in your homes. This could be what you could bring in your homes because you know who's the boss of your home? You know who's the leader in your home? You are. You're the one that's going to be responsible. You're the one that's going to stand before God alone. You can't say, well, I can't do it because this person around me is what. We're going to be standing before God alone. Right? So let's get it on now. Watch this. God knows what's going on in our lives. Even our childhood hurts. And this next song sums up what the Heavenly Father is doing in this revival. His heart is breaking for his people and he's coming to set the captives free. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us because he has anointed us to preach good news. The Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon us because he
I want to tell you so many people on those prayer lines, I couldn't believe who I met. I want to show you a Catholic deacon and just the opposite in a way is a hyper independent Baptist who were touched through the revival. They say it best. Watch this. Here are just two ministers I talked to, one Catholic and the other Baptist. I was uh, feeling half dead, you know, I had no, I had no get up and go. Um, it was very difficult for me to function. You were prayed for, we saw you fall down. Now what happened? You, I saw you got up after a while and all that. How do you feel right now? Major healing, I would describe it as. Major healing, Re freedom from those old hurts, and those old scars and the guilt feelings. You know. What would you say to others? Is this something for everybody? Oh, I, they don't know what they're missing. I mean, uh, yes, I mean, the touch of the Lord is, is, is incomparable. And everybody should have it because it totally transforms. You're never the same again. What do you think of the revival today? Well, if I was willing to criticize the Baptists, how much more I criticize the Charismatics, the Pentecostals. We'd have nothing to do with any form of spiritual gift movement. So when I heard of this work, I tried my hardest. I had tried to stop criticizing, but I had too many questions, and the questions kept pricking uh, my conscience. And so the criticism, I started to criticize it. Couldn't be God. Couldn't possibly be God to have people laughing on the floor or to uh, have people shaking. But these things began to happen in my own church. And when they began to happen in my own church, I had to come here to find out if it was the same thing that I had heard here. So I did come. And God so gently by His Spirit just touched my own life each time I came, touching parts of me to assure me that this was Him. It was tender. It was very gentle. I, um, I would have preached against all what was going on here. This has now become my life. I can't stay away. Because this work of God, we need. This work of God, we need. Now, let me tell you again, don't wait for it to happen in your church. It needs to happen in your home. And it can happen in your home. And tonight, we're going to also, we're going to be praying for that impartation, right? That step we're going to make towards it, right? But you see what I'm saying? Now, we're going to take you, this, this to me is key. The generation that's coming up, our young people, a lot of them are falling away from the church, right? I mean, they could see through it. Look, when I was a hippie, before I knew Jesus, you know, all we need is love. <laughs> you know, all the wonderful stuff that we started realizing that, you know, didn't work. I mean, I was searching for God. But I would go to a church and... It, I looked at it and go, this can't be the God of Israel. When you start seeing God moving and you start seeing him move in a way that's miraculous, you start seeing your needs being met, right? When I got saved, I just said, God of Israel, if Jesus is who these Christians say he is, the son of the living God, the Messiah, then I want him in my heart. Okay? If he's not, I don't want to have anything to do with him because I don't want to do anything to tick you off. <laughs> All of a sudden, I had this 10 out of 10 grade marijuana, and I went, why am I doing this? I flushed the whole thing down the toilet, this whole package of this stuff, right? I start walking through my shelves, and I start looking at these books and going, why is that book there? 
I felt the holiness of God. No one preached to me. I just started. It was like God was in the house, in my house. And I started seeing these things. I started throwing these things away. I put on an album. I remember it was a Beatle album. And I hear, goo goo ka goo 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 ka And I'm going, what does that have to do with anything? And I just started throwing records out, OK? My wife comes home. She goes, what are you doing? I said, Jesus is in the house. She goes, don't throw my records away. She later got into God. But, but the key is our children. You know, we, for the, our generation's sake, we need to be the leaders. We need to be the ones that go after. They might think you're weird at first, but you just keep pressing in to God. And I'm telling you, as they start seeing the church, you know what they're going to come to when they go through problems? Who are they going to ask to pray for them? Crazy uncle such and such. Right? I know that he believes in God, and I'm facing something difficult. They're not going to go to somebody else, right? Watch this, because this is what the prophecy of Joel is talking about. This is what Pentecost was talking about. It was the beginning of something where God would not just send his spirit upon certain prophets, but with the new covenant, he was saying, now I'm going to pour my spirit on all flesh. Everyone who believes upon me is going to be a prophet. There'll be prophets, kings, priests. They'll be used in the gifts of the Spirit. Watch this. I'm convinced this is God. And he's not just moving in Toronto. He's pouring out his love and power all over the world. Because this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And we desperately need this mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Our young people seem lost, and nothing short of a real move of God will reach them. Now, you're both what? Sisters. Yes, yeah, sisters. Yeah. All right, and tell me what happened, how the renewal, how this revival has affected you. Okay, um, well, first of all, we came last year for the Catch the Fire 95, and we were forced to come by our mom, you know. It was kind of like a family thing. We all had to come, and a lot of us teenagers were just really, like, church for a week? I don't think so, you know. But when we came, we really realized that it was God, and I re God just became more real to me, you know. He just came, became more intimate with me. And I began to, to see that he, he knows me so well. And I love that. It just made me smile. You know, it's like, God, you just, you know me so well. I, you know, more than anybody knows me. You know, my personality and what I'm going to say and what I'm going to think about. And it just really touched my heart. And now, what about you? Um, God became more real to me also. And I was, I felt really dead inside. Now I feel much more alive. And God, um, one of the things that I knew was killing me was my CDs. It had a lot of, like, death in the song, written in the songs and stuff, and so God told me to go home and break this, and ever since I've just felt so free to worship God and just m much more alive. What did you think of church before the revival touched your life? Um, it was probably the most boring place I ever went, actually. It was, I had to be dragged to go there. I never wanted to go, but now that there's this church, I like I can't wait to come here. Like I love coming here. I come here as much as I possibly can. It's totally changed my life around. Like I was so messed up before, like I was just going downhill so so bad. And I had like no respect for anyone and it's just totally changed my life around. It's given me something to live for and I just <laughs> I don't know, I'm happy for once and it's real. And I'm telling you, you look at that, you know, God just wants to reach our young people with something real. And listen, they have a passion. When they get a hold of something, your kids are going to go for it. Again, we don't have to wait for your, the revival, this magic cloud to come down from heaven. Revival is one. Let me tell you, Duncan Campbell, the Hebrides revival, Duncan Campbell came. This great revival broke out in Hebrides, the Isle of Hebrides. And he came and he says, you know, I'm really upset that people look at me as this mighty man of God that brought in this revival. I want to tell you, 
This revival was here before I ever came. There were two elderly women, 80 years old, one near blind, who said, something's got to be done. Our young people are falling away. Look at this state of the church. They started going to their leader, their pastor. They said, we need revival. Said, That's nice, ladies. They started praying and getting a hold of God. They started having revival. They were being awakened by the power of God. They were moving with God. And they kept praying and praying and praying. And all of a sudden, some men saw them praying. And they started joining. And some women started joining. Them, and it started breaking out. By the time Duncan Campbell came, he just put the, put, took the lid off that was already going to explode. And that great revival broke out. Are you that person? Are you that person that could be the fire starter? That's why we're doing this thing. That's what I'm sharing with you because I believe all over the world, my vision is that as people take these tapes, begin playing them for their friends, playing them in their households, start playing even this one now and get that impartation, one fire in this home, one fire in that home, one fire in that little church, one fire over here. It's going to be a fires that are going to be lit all over the world. And then God's spirit's going to come because the, the timbers are, gra are, are dry, ready for kindling. And God's spirit's going to go <laughs> blow upon it. And there's going to be a mighty roaring fire, a revival that's going to come. But it got to start with one. And the question is, will be, we be that one? Now, let me tell you one thing about Brownsville. I learned a lot about all three of the revivals. Why do vi revivals not last? They seem to, in history, they take this thing and then whatever. I want to tell you something. It has to do with something very important. We get touched. It's like when we get saved. We turn to God, and it like that's our experience, and it ends. You know? Salvation is the beginning of an amazing journey with God. It's an amazing adventure. It's only the beginning. It's where little babies going, goo goo, dad, da, mama. You know? And when we sin, what happens? God has to clean our diapers. But when you start getting older in the faith, I don't know about you. If I'm a parent, I don't want to clean my son's 22 year old diaper. It's time that we just stepping in. See, God is, God is merciful in that. But when I went to the Brownsville Revival, it blew me away. There were, you know, hundreds of people running to the altar every night. And we're going to, this great re altar call that they did. And a lot of them were Christians, or quote unquote, what we call Christianity today. Lukewarm, zombie-like, I'm serious. They may even had a real experience with God. At one time, matter of fact, some of them stood up there and said, when I was 10 years old, I received Jesus. Precious little thing. And then, and then, boom, it happened. Then the drugs. Then the prostitution. That's what I'm talking about. Steve Hill used to say a thing. He used to say in one of his altar calls, he used to say, there's some of you who have the communion wafer on your tongue and you're still going to hell. Some of you have the fresh water of baptism on you, and you're still going to hell because you really haven't made that connection with God. You're walking around not walking in the things of God. You made that little prayer of faith, and you think that's all there is. And it shocked me to see one person after another. But the good news is these people got a hold of God. They were getting a commitment, and some of them were even getting rebaptized. Oh, theology. People are going to get, oh, you can't do that. Let me tell you something. These are the most powerful services filmed where these people would get up there and share, and they'd be overcome by the power of God in the baptism tanks. Let's watch this baptism service. I don't know what you felt tonight, friend, when that man stood in that baptismal pool. Brethren, I don't know where you are, and don't raise your hand. But with tears in his eyes, he said he committed adultery just a few months ago, seven or eight months ago, and he's lost his family. He's lost his children, and he's lost his business. Sin is horrible. I committed adultery, and I've lost everything in my life. 
that has ever meant anything to me. My family, my two young children, and a wonderful job. And I'm here to say today that the Lord Jesus, this is your life. Tell me what you want me to do and let me do it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. It'll be a year in March since I was raped. And I'm, I'm being baptized today to let the devil know that he is under my feet and that's where he's going to stay. And... <laughs> And that I don't live there anymore. I don't live in the depression and the thoughts of hating life and hating, hating everything and hating myself and not wanting to live. And that's not going to be me anymore. Because I'm giving it to God because I can't fight this fight alone. Okay. Baptize you now in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. God is real. All my life I went to church, but I just went through the motions. I never knew who God was. To make a long story short, this March my, my wife left me and she took my little boy. I just wanted God to touch me. I said, God, give me direction. And he gave me, I was being prayed for me. He gave me the fire. The fire of God. I got such a hunger and a thirst for him, it's unbelievable. I said, touch me. I'm not happy unless you give me it all. Because God is so big. I chose to be baptized in the name of Jesus because he is the only way. He said he is the way, the truth, and the light. I want it all. Praise God. I don't know about you, but that breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to know the pain that we have sitting in our pews. The people who are so desperate. And we just don't want to take the cap off, do we? We just want to keep it suppressed. There's people that get saved and sit next to somebody that's more of a dope addict than they were. I'm serious in the churches today. The condition of the church. There's all kinds of stuff that we accept as being okay. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of playing church. I'm tired of it every day. I don't want to play church when I know that there's so much more. I've seen it. I'm telling you, I've experienced it. For eight years, I've been immersed in revival. My life has forever changed. I'll never go back to the way I was. Paul the Apostle. He had something, he said he was older in life when he wrote Philippians. Listen to the words he said. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Messiah. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge. Why, Paul? Why do you count everything lost? All the great things you might have done. I count them lost just to know Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but dung, refuge, 
that I may win Christ. That I may win Christ? Paul the Apostle? If Paul the Apostle didn't know Jesus, we're all in trouble. But I'll tell you what, he knew he was born again. It's just that he looked at himself in the mirror and said, as far as I'm concerned, I'm nowhere born again where I need to be. I'm not in that level of glory. I want to go to the next level of the glory and next level of glory. I want to see Jesus when I look in the mirror. I don't want to see my ugly face anymore. He went on to say that I might, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. See the humility in Paul? It's like looking at your estate and saying, God, I'm hungry. I'm desperate. I need you to really be the son or daughter you want me to be. I need your power. In Ezekiel, it says that the new covenant, I will give you a new heart. Not like the one that was there before. One that's pliable, that could be written upon by the Holy Spirit. And I'll give you a new spirit, meaning a new nature, being born again. And then I will put my Holy Spirit in you. You know why? Then you'll be able to walk in my statutes and obey my commandments. Wow. So Paul is saying that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. You know what that's talking about? Jesus never said, I want you to hang on the cross like me. He said, I want you to pick up your cross and follow me. And you know what it is? The cross is to, for dying to self. The cross is to put to death everything that you hate in yourself. And to walk after Messiah and to fall in love with him and spend time soaking in his presence is to put on the new man, which God the Father already sees you as being through the nail-scarred hands of your son. Do you know what he calls you? The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul says, if I by any means might attain the, unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already mature or perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend him who apprehended me. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. You know what the word apprehend is to overtake. The policeman apprehends you when you're going in the wrong direction. Jesus apprehended us because we were going in the wrong direction. What Paul said is he apprehended me and took me off of the road I was going on in Damascus where I was going to persecute the church, knocked me off the high horse of my pride, put me in the dirt. I beheld a vision of him. I was blinded for three days. And then I said, by the rest of my life, he's saying, I then heard Jesus say, follow me. So I began trying to apprehend he. I tried to overtake him. I tried to get him to know him so well that I could become like him. That's what apprehend. To apprehend the concept is to overtake that concept, to understand it. And what did Jesus say? You who are heavy laden, I have come to give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. It's light and easy. All you need to do, he said, is yoke yourself to me, walk with me, and he said, learn to me, but what that means is get to know me. That's all I got to do. That's my assignment. See, that's what the word of God is. That's what this whole thing of worship is. That's what this whole thing, it's, it's trying to apprehend he who apprehended us and not stopping. Well, it's nice. He did this thing for me and now I'm saved. No, it's like I'm pressing on. I'm going into the holy of holies. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind the good and the bad, the successes and the failures, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God and Messiah Jesus. You know what it is? As you run through this life, as you're running, as you're going after God, some of us have stumbled, and we go, where are you, God? The minute we cry out to him, he comes right back. He says, you okay? Yeah. He brushes us off. Come on, follow me again. 
And I want to just share this last thing with you before we actually will witness the altar call. My people Israel were encamped outside the tabernacle. The majority of the people were outside the tabernacle. They were in the camp. It was only the priests, the Levites, that were in the tabernacle. And only once a year could a high priest enter in on the Day of Atonement. He could enter into the Holy of Holies, the awesome presence of God, to bring the blood to put on the mercy seat that he might obtain mercy and forgiveness for the nation Israel once a year. But let me tell you something. We have Jesus who paid a horrible price as the perfect lamb who takes away the sins, our sins, and we could obtain this forgiveness through him by his shedding of his blood because he, worked, he walked perfect. He was the most Torah observant Jew that ever lived. Paul says, I was blameless, but he still had to bring sacrifices every time he sinned. Jesus never sinned once. He never had to use the mercy clause. That's why he was able to pay the penalty for us when we believe upon him as a perfect sacrifice. But you know what he did? His blood that he shed allowed him to sit at the right hand of the Father, where he is now, on the mercy seat that's in heaven. And what this altar call that's coming up is about was sung at the Brownsville Revival, talked about the mercy seat, coming into the Holy of Holies. God wants us to come in tonight. I don't know about you, but I want a breakthrough for all of us here tonight. I want uh, all of us to have a breakthrough tonight. As this altar call, where hundreds of thousands would come forward to get in contact with God, as this thing plays, as you watch it, for just as the God moves on you, some of you are going to say, I want to come forward tonight, and I want to see, receive that impartation. Some of you, you may not be able to come forward. You might sit in your seats and just get alone with God. I don't want to tell you what to do, but I'm telling you, there is something ready to happen in this room. And there are people who are watching this video. They're watching this in their homes and they're saying, I want you, God. I need you, God. I don't want to go out of here the same way I came in. I want to go out of here with some kind of impartation, some kind of thing where I'm hungry for God, where I'm going after God, where I'm pressing into the Holy of Holies. And I'm telling you that if you make that step tonight, you're prophesying your future. Okay? You could have a greater tomorrow. God wants to give you a new testimony tonight. You don't have to talk about the old one that you can't talk about anymore. You're going to say, something happened the other night. I was with God. I went forward. God touched me, and my life is the same. I desire him above all other things. Listen, so many of the things we worry about are temporal, wood, hay, and stubble. We get so upset about things in our lives that are not even going to be eternal. And the eternal things, we're just letting time tick away on this earth when we could be getting into eternity now. The Holy Spirit is the seal of the promise of the inheritance that we already have waiting for us. And we can begin to be partakers of that tonight. I feel like God wants to move in some lights and hearts tonight. And as you hear this song, I just want you to hear the words this is about stepping in. We have an Old Testament form in the church today, just like my people Israel did. Everybody's sitting on the outside of the camp when we have been called to be the priests in the tabernacle. When he has said Jesus suffered this incredible death for us, penalty, he, he was, his blood was shed for us. The veil was rent, which was his own flesh, he broke down the middle wall of petition so there's no separation. We don't have to sit in the camp. We could go into the Holy of Holies whenever we want. And yet we're just sitting in the camp as spectators. And that's one of the things that Sid Roth talks about all the time. Let's get out of the camp. Let's get into God's kingdom. Let's go after God. Let's take the kingdom by force. So, Father, I just pray before we play this thing, I just pray that you just move in hearts tonight. 
that we might receive this impartation from you, that your Holy Spirit will come. We are the temples of the living God, but we've been operating on empty. We've been operating on fumes. We need you, God. We need your spirit to come and refresh us. We need to know that it's not just a one-time thing, that there's new manna every day. Oh, God, make it real. We've been sitting here all night long looking at these great revivals, experiencing some of it. But, God, now's our turn. We want it now, God. God, please come. Fill us with your presence. Overtake us with your mercy. Overtake us with your love. Deposit in us your glory that we might be filled to overflowing, that we might give it away. In Yeshua's name. I pray. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. Those of you that need forgiveness, you're going to come quickly. Don't let pride hold you back. You stomp on the devil. He loves pride. Bible says that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud. He turns from it but gives grace to those who want forgiveness. He gives mercy to those who want forgiveness. Charity's going to sing mercy seat. Everyone who needs forgiveness, everyone who wants God to wash them clean, everyone who needs Jesus tonight to wash your sins away, I want you to come right now. Do not hesitate. Hurry right now come on hurry right now hurry right now kneel at these altars kneel at these altars come on hurry in the balcony let's go hurry in the balcony let's go come on come on sing it charity everything is unknown come on come on hurry i face the power hurry of hurry. sin on hurry. my own hurry i did not know of a place i could go where to you. You are eligible for pardon. He'll forgive you. He'll wash you. He'll cleanse you. But don't get all the way to the edge, friend, with your sin. Step back. Step back from the edge and say, Jesus, I can't go any further. I want you to wash me. I want you to cleanse me. I want you to make me new, Jesus. He'll do it, friend. If you'll repent, if you'll repent, if you'll repent. Come on right now. Come on right now. Come on. Hurry. 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 Hurry, 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 come on, come on, come on, in the Family Life Center, come on, come on, put me over there, put me over there, come on, 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 God bless you, son. Lovely God bless you, man. They never come true. Come on. Come on. But I know where there's a place come on. of mercy come on. for you. In the family life center, let's go. He said come on, that you could come, come into on. his presence. Neil, right here. Be the Lord of my life. Be my Savior. Be my very best friend. Come on. 
I can feel this. Everyone at the altar, keep your heads down and keep going after God at the altar. Keep going after God. God hears your moaning. God hears your groaning. God, we come before you right now. We cry out to you, God. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. Come and fill these temples. Come and fill us tonight. Fill us to overflowing, oh God. Fill us up, Lord God. Oh God, change us. Change us. Let your spirit come and change us. Oh God, God, we can't take it anymore. We can't live this way anymore. God, we need you. We need you. We need a fresh start. Some of you right now, some of you right now, you're just sensing, oh God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to go further, but you're making that step tonight. Just keep coming. You got to get to the point where you're so infatuated with God where you say, oh God, I need you more than the food I need to eat. I need you more than the water that I need to drink to sustain my life. That's how much I need you, God. I need you more than the air that I breathe. God, I need you. I need you. I need you. He hears the cry of his people tonight. He hears you crying to him. He hears you shouting out to him in your hearts. And he says, I love you. I love you. I sent my son to die that you might be able to come into the Holy of Holies. Now, how many of you have told Daddy God, I love you. I thank you for what you've done. It's time to tell Daddy, I love you. Just, he's waiting to hear us say, Daddy, I love you. I love you, Abba Father. I love you, Daddy God. Thank you for what you've done. Put your arms around the Father. These outpourings happened. It was the Father's Day outpouring in Brownsville. On Father's Day is when that outpouring happened. The Father's Day outpouring. John Arnott didn't call it the Toronto Blessing. He called it the Father's Blessing. There's something about the Father wanting to communicate the God of Israel that he's not a bad cop in the sky. Everything Jesus was, the compassion, the love, the mercy, that's who the God of Israel is. Daddy God, we love you tonight. Now the whole key to this thing is coming forward on a daily basis. I've even included in the DVD that I have a cleansing prayer that you could pray daily and a consecration, a prayer of consecration. Because what we need to learn is the art of soaking, tarrying, that thing that happened on Pentecost wasn't a one-time event. It, God was trying to teach the church to tarry. They had already been born again. They had already been, they had already received the Holy Spirit in the room when Jesus was resurrected. He says, my peace I give unto you, and he breathed on them. My peace I give unto you. He nefeshed on them. He breathed in new life, just like God breathed in life into Adam. He breathed in, then he said, I still want you on the day of Pentecost when it fully comes to tarry. See, tarrying is something of waiting in his presence. Don't make us Marthas, make us Marys, Lord. We just want to just stay at your feet sometimes. Oh, God. See, there's three tricks of the enemy. From you going and achieving your destiny and purpose on earth. Three tricks. One is he wants to condemn, make you feel condemned by reminding you of your past. You're not good enough to be a son and daughter. That is a lie from the pit of hell. Nobody's good enough, but Jesus made us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Then the next trick is this. If I could only go to Bible college, if I can only get that job, he tries to get us fixed on the future. Some of us are trying to get into the future, and if we could only, if we could only, if we could only. You don't have your future. You don't even have the next day. You don't even have the next hour. Let me tell you something, folks. We're just a breath away from eternity. <sighs> that could be my last breath. That could be your last breath. So what is Jesus saying? Take no thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. 
Why do you toil? What are you looking for? God will provide you clothes. Doesn't he clothe the fields? Right? Why are you worried about food? He feeds the ravens. We worry about temporal things. We don't even know if we're going to worry. We're, we're worried about bills and all kinds of stuff. Let me tell you something. We could just get alone with God moment by moment. It's not about just in church. It's not just about, it's about learning to walk and soak in his presence and practice his presence and begin to realize that we're yoked to him. And that we could say not, what do I do next, O oh Lord? It's, what do we do next, O oh Lord? We're thinking about we being yoked to him. Father, I pray for that right now, that outpouring of sense of being yoked to you being yoked to your son Jesus, walking with him, wanting to take every moment captive for the kingdom, Father God. I pray for that revival spirit that's already swept into this place to overtake us and come in. That seed of revival, that wanting more, wanting more, wanting more, knowing that there's so much more you want to give us. He wants us. He has a destiny and plan and purpose that he created before you were ever created, before the foundations of the world. He created you for some destiny and purpose, and he wants you to go into that right now in Yeshua's name. So, Father, I just pray right now for everyone here that you learn what we have learned tonight, this process of getting before God. See, this isn't, so some of you are going to say, well, I've done that thing. No, this is a lifestyle, folks. Revival is a lifestyle. Like Paul, seeing myself not have yet attained to where I need to be, not have having won Christ to the degree I can win him, you understand? That's what we're learning tonight. So, Father, I just pray for people right here, right now. We're going to pray for impartation for some of you tonight that want it. We're going to pray for more. But I just want you to know that God has begun a thing tonight. And this is the beginning of revival in many people's lives. You got it. So I just want to pray right now, Father, I just pray you seal this thing right now. There's people that want to go deeper, and we're going to let you, we're going to keep staying here. We're going to keep going for it if you want. But I want to just say to you right now, some of you may have to leave, and you can if you want. But just let me pray. Father, I pray for the peace, the shalom of God that surpasses all understanding. I pray for the seed of revival to take place in each one of us. Oh, God, make us hungry for you. Make us hungry for you. Tonight, some of you are going out and you're getting the belly full. Some of you just got a little, you got the hors d'oeuvre. And some of you going to take advantage and try to get the whole meal tonight. But I just say right now, Father, I just say that you continue to move in us and through us. Just keep coming, Holy Spirit, just more of you. Oh, fill her with your glory, Lord God, the glory of the living God. You're his temple. You're his temple. God wants to move with power on you. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Those disappointments that you have gone through in your life, those things that didn't come to pass, God didn't abandon you, sister. God loves you. God loves you. He's here for you right tonight. He wants to restore what the canker worm has eaten away. He's about to restore it. And you know what? You don't have to worry. Just keep going after him. As you go after him, he takes care of the thing. He's the one that will fight your battles. You don't need to fight him anymore. You don't have to fight the battles. Oh, God. Oh, God. And I remove off your shoulders right now, sister, things that the enemy has put upon you, others have put upon you, weights, heavy weights that, that and you could take some of these prayers. If I'm praying over her, you could take this for yourself. Heavy weights that have you put your, on your own shoulders, but other things that people have put on you and burdened you with. And Jesus is putting on right now his light and easy yoke. Just walk with him and, and just begin to just love him right now. Does that make sense to you, the things I was sharing with you? It does? Okay. I want to make sure when I say something like this, I want to make sure that I'm dead on. Dead on. Father God, I just pray right now. Lord God, just give her more of you. More of you, God. Fill her to overflowing. God, peace that surpasses all understanding. 
Now listen, when the glory is around like this, if you have any kind of physical things, God wants to heal you. He will heal you. He wants to heal you right now. Father God, I just pray for that healing to take place right now, the glory. See, it's not about even the healing. It's just if you start asking God to fill the temple, the glory comes in. And it's the glory of God. When the glory's there, all fear has to leave. All anxiety has to leave. All sickness has to leave. See, we got to run. We're looking for a healing instead of looking for God. We're looking for a healing instead of looking for a relationship with God. God is a person. He's a person. He made us in his image. He could love. He could laugh. And he has likes and dislikes. But we want God to be like us instead of us being like him. So, Father God, I just pray right now. The glory is here in her. Just come and increase the glory, and whatever that condition is, in Yeshua's name, it'll be taken care of. Just keep concentrating on calling God and saying, I want your glory to fill this temple, my temple. That prayer that I include in the DVDs is to dedication. It's a cleansing and dedication of every part of our being, every part of the temple to be given to God, our hands, our eyes, our feet. See, we're supposed to be the vessels that God uses of the tabernacle, the temple, and that's what God wants to do. Oh, God, bless this little guy, Lord God, right now in Yeshua's name. Just bless him. Oh, God, he's got so much before him. Father God, I just pray right now in Yeshua's name that you just come and fill him with your presence to overflowing. Oh, God, more of you, more of you, more of your presence, oh, God more of your glory. Fill him, Lord God. Just fill him. So you just keep, t you say it yourself, just fill me, God. Fill me with your presence. And just receive what he wants to give you. See? Father God, I just pray for this. This your son over here next to you? No? Yeah. Father God, I just pray for this father and son. I just pray right now. See, when, when your son saw his daddy come forward, the son comes too. See? That's what we're talking about. Father God, I just pray for this, this man of God right now in Yeshua's name. I thank you for him. I thank you that he had the guts to come forward, that he had the guts to press in. Father God, I pray right now in Yeshua's name that you just continue to bless him, to overshadow him with your love. I pray for the glory to come and fill him to overflowing. More of you, more of you, more of you, more of you, less of me. John the Baptist prayed that, more of you, less of me. Brother, I just want to pray for you. I saw you waiting outside. I think God's, you, you, you were coming for this very night. This was for you. This was for you, brother. This night was for you. Yeah, yeah. I saw you outside when I was watching people come in, and I saw you, and I knew God was going to touch you in a radical way. Oh, don't worry about the things of the past. The enemy has tried, tried to condemn you with things of the past, am I right? And he's tried to put trips on you. Let me tell you something, it's all new, it's brand new. God has a brand new thing for you. You don't even have to talk about yesterday. You need to talk about what he's doing now. Now, now, tonight is a new night. It's the beginning of a new day. You don't have to look backward. You could just look at each moment with you. See, that's what it's about, is learning to take each moment. Don't let the enemy condemn you for the moment that just happened. I don't care if it just happened and you did something. All you got to do is confess it and come before the Lord and say, forgive me, Lord, and enable me by, my, by your spirit to walk in victory. And if you got to do that over and over and over again, that's all it is. It's not about being perfect. It's having a heart for the things of God and trying to walk in that way he has you to walk. Brother, there's a new day for you, a new day. New day, new day, old failures, they're all gone. God remembers your sin no more. You need to also forgive those around who have despitefully used you, who you feel have done things against you. Let me tell you something, just forgive them because you know what? It doesn't matter in eternity. Your eternal destiny is right now. People, your eternal destiny is what you're dealing with tonight. Your eternal destiny. Father God, in Jesus' name, Jesus' name. Oh, Lord, just thank you for this.
woman of God, Father. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Oh, Lord, just fill her with more of you, more of your Holy Spirit, more of your presence, oh God, more of you, more of you. Some of you, you say, more of you, God. I want more of you and less of me. If you have the guts, pray all of you and none of me. That's what I pray. None of me. I want all of you. Father God, just fill her with your overflowing glory. Fill her. It's getting deeper right now. I could just sense the, the, the power of God coming on you right now in Jesus' name. It's coming. It's There it is. There it is. More. More. There it is. There it is. The glory is there right now. The glory is there right now. There it is. There it is. It's just right there. Right there. Take it. Just keep taking it. Just keep taking it. Just keep taking it. Keep taking it. Keep taking it. Keep taking it. It's yours. It's yours. More, more, more. See, when the power of God comes, this is what happens. It, it, it's don't, and you look and you go, oh, whatever. This is, this is how her body's reacting to it. You may be different, but praise God. Praise God. She's getting something. You'll talk to somebody like this later, and they'll tell you about a dream, a vision, or something that happened, like what it said in those, one of those revivals where they visited heaven. If you want to judge it, man, you're missing out on what God wants to do in your life. Don't judge it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I thank you for this woman. In Jesus' name, I just pray that you just touch her right now. Fill her with your presence to overflow. More of you. More of you, Lord God. More of you. The power of God. The power of God upon her. The glory of God within her. Oh, gosh. Just keep coming. Just keep coming, Holy Spirit. There it is. I just sense God's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Whew. Just drink it in. Just drink it in. Jesus didn't say think. He said drink. <laughs> he said drink. Oh, take a big gulp. God and kingdom of heaven gives you a lot of big gulps, right? Oh, yes, Lord. Woo! glory more of you more of you boy i'm getting the overspill here whoa more god more 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 of you lord god more of you lord god yeah there's something coming on you this that god is breaking some some depression god is breaking some some things heavy things that you're on he's breaking it right now and he's, he's bringing you the joy, and it's spilling over on me. <laughs> Praise you, Lord. Oh, I love when he does it. This more fun praying for people than receiving sometimes like this, in this type of thing. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Glory to you, Lord. More of you, Lord God. More, 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 more for my sister. Just give her more. She's hungry for you, Lord God. She wants you to come. Totally change her, transform her. Oh, God, just come. It's about the glory. He'll do the rest. You don't have to even ask for that thing that you want. Just let him come and say, I'm open for you to come and dwell in me. See, God wants us to be his mobile home. <laughs> the temples of the living God. You know? He didn't want to be locked up in the temple. He didn't want to be locked up in the tabernacle. He wants to be in us. Imagine that the Father, God, who created the heavens and the earth, wants to be in us. Whoa, by his spirit. Father God, just keep coming, Holy Spirit. Boy, I feel like a, a tingling and a warmth right at the top of your head. My hand is actually tingling right now, and I'm, I'm just getting this because it's coming. God's coming to you. It has nothing to do with me. It's just his glory is there. His glory is there. Whew, wow. Wow, just keep taking it. Just keep taking it. It's yours. It's yours. Just keep coming, Holy Spirit. Just keep coming. There's perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. You feel peace right now, don't you? You feel the peace of God, right? Yep. It's just an incredible peace. Incredible peace. There's a peace in this room right now. Take it for you. Those of you that are back there, take it. You know? Take that for yourself. Take that for yourself. Lord God, more, 
for her, Lord God, right now in Yeshua's name. More of you, more of you, more of your presence, more of your glory. Just keep coming, Holy Spirit. Just keep coming. Oh, God, more of you, more of you, more of you, more of you, more of you. Sister, keep, keep soaking in the presence. But what are you feeling right now? Peace. Just a bunch of peace from the Lord. Have you been in peace lately? Only when I bask in Him. There's no peace without Him. Right. So it's just basking in His glory, and, and, and God brings peace. Shalom. 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 Father God, I just pray for my sister right now. I just pray that you just come and touch her. Just overwhelm her with your love. Overwhelm her with your glory. Come and fill her to overflowing right now in Yeshua's name. So, you know, I'm not pushing people down, folks. I'm very gentle. I don't want that. I'm, I'm just letting, if God, if God wants to do that, he'll do that. And it happens often. Father God, I just thank you right now in Yeshua's name. Just the glory come. The glory is intensifying right now. God's glory, his desire to meet, because there's been so much crying out in this room for him. He's here. He's here right now. Just fill her to overflowing right now in Yeshua's name. More glory, more glory, more glory. Just take it in. Just receive what God wants for you. He wants to give you his all. He's giving you himself. He's coming with a visitation, but not just a visitation. He wants to have a habitation, a dwelling place. Willing vessels. He's looking for willing vessels where he can inhabit and they could give their, that love away to others. Father, just give her an infilling of that incredible love of the Father, that overwhelming love, that merciful love, the glory of God. The priest couldn't even stand to minister under the glory. Why are we surprised that things happen like this? And as we learn to soak more and more, it's like a sponge. You put a sponge in water, it, it, it starts getting wet. But the longer it soaks, I like the pickle analogy. You know how a cucumber becomes a pickle? It soaks in the pickle juice. And the longer it soaks, the more it takes on the quality of the pickle juice. So I say, I love getting pickled in the, in the Lord. Soaking in the pickle juice of the Lord. It sounds blasphemous, it's not. It's just a good illustration, isn't it? The glory of God, the glory of God, the glory of it. See, she's just drinking it. She's just drinking it in. I mean, how could we not want to keep doing this? I mean, really, what else is there? Because we're going to be doing this for all eternity. We're going to be having this, right? Why not start getting in practice now? Why not start getting in practice now for what God has for us? Right now in Yeshua's name, just more of it. Of him. Let his glory come. Fill her to overflowing. Let the glory of God come. Fill this temple. Fill this temple. Fill this temple. There is no lack, sister. There's, he has everything for you right now in Yeshua's name. He has everything for you right now in Yeshua's name. Everything. 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 Keep taking it. More. Increase it. Increase it. Increase it 50%. Increase it 60%. 70%. 100% in Yeshua's name. 100%, Lord God. 100% of your glory. Of your glory. Of your glory. Of your glory. Yes, Lord God. Yes, Lord God. Keep coming, Holy Spirit. Fill her to overflowing. Fill her with more of you. More of your presence. More of you. More of you more of your glory. Just fill this temple to overflowing. Oh God, oh God, yes Lord, just fill her. Just fill her. Oh, it's increasing, it's increasing.